Okay. Today we are going to look at intestinal physiology. We're just going to touch on that because we really did it two weeks ago. And then we will touch on intestinal markers. And then we are going to look at some case studies. With those case studies, I'm going to walk you through the kinds of questions I would ask, how the markings get put together. I talk about the answers that uh, these clients actually gave me to specific questions and the types of recommendations we could make in these situations. We are going to, I promised you two case studies, we're actually going to do three case studies tonight just because it's too much fun, right? Right. So I'm glad you're with me tonight. We're going to be together for 90 minutes. I hope you have booked off 90 minutes and I hope you're in a situation where you can totally focus on what we are going to do tonight. You know, if you've got your cell phone handy and who doesn't, right? Please turn the ringer off if you can. I understand that there might be times when that's not a feasible thing to do, but I even turn mine down. And um, if you've got Facebook going on your computer, turn it off. You know, just get rid of all of the distractions. Be with me for the next 90 minutes so that we can really work with this together. We are going to do three case studies. And at the very end, I am going to do a complete analysis, not necessarily asking the questions and coming up with recommendations, but the complete analysis in five minutes. And I'm going to show you how iridology can simplify your practice, how you can use iridology to integrate everything you already know about nutrition or herbology or whatever your specialty is. My goal tonight is that you will actually leave our time together with information that you can use with your next client. So please be focused. I do want to get to know you a little bit. So we have some polls that will help me to, to do that. And it's important because these are always small groups. You have to understand that iridology is a very niche market. It's a very small market. And there's not a lot of people out there clamoring for it. So it means that we always have a small group attending these things. And that means I need everyone to play all in. You'll get more if you do too. Uh, and the purpose for doing many of these polls is for me to get to know you a little bit better because I will tweak the webinar on the fly. If I know I've got people who are more into nutrition, I can slant the information that way. If I know you're more into iridology, or into <laughs> iridology, of course you are. Uh, herbology, I can slant it that way. If I know you've got a broad background, I can make sure we do some of everything. Also, if I know that you have a background in something like that, you probably have anatomy and physiology, and I don't need to go into such detail with that. But if I know that you don't have much of a background, then I will give you the anatomy and physiology that we need. So our very first poll is this one. And again, I'm just asking everyone to play all in with me. Uh, what training do you already have in holistic healing? Do you have nutrition? Are you a herbalist, homeopath, um, uh, body work, or not much yet, just starting out? Okay, for those of you who have just joined us, just asking you to play with me in the sandbox here and do this little poll so that I can make this webinar fit your needs. And I bet some of you just don't even have your audio up yet. Just give the newcomers just a half a moment to, um, to get in here. All right, so not much yet, just starting out, excellent. Anybody else wanna weigh in on this? I think we've got it all. Super good. Thank you. So we've got nutrition and someone who's pretty much a beginner. So I'm excited to have you with me because we can make this fit for all of you. Just also wanted to log out a few invitations for you. Number one, join me on YouTube. I post a lot of webinar stuff on YouTube, a lot of recordings about iridology and natural health. So the short form is bit.ly and then that little seven figure uh, address, or you can search for Judith Cobb on YouTube. Now, the one thing that might disappoint you, I don't know, you're not going to find any cat videos on my webs on my YouTube. And you're not going to find any of those terrible videos of people getting hurt while everybody is laughing at them. You know, it's really iridology and holistic health. So if you want to have that kind of information made available, and you want to know when it's coming out, just search for me on YouTube and subscribe to the channel. Additionally, um, I invite you to follow me on Facebook at Iridology Education. 
another great way to engage in the conversation, and on Instagram at iridology.education. Great ways to keep up with me. And again, Instagram, I'm pretty active there, posting little one-minute videos because that's all you're allowed to post. But some most of it is iridology information, hardcore iridology information, a 60-second class. So again, I invite you to follow me there and uh, connect with me. And just because I'm inviting you to do that, I need to know as well for today, what iridology training do you already have? None yet, Jensenian, other school, constitutional, or your IPA certified? Great, okay, we've got three people who are pretty brand new here tonight. Awesome, and the rest of you've got something under your belt, great. Okay, I will make sure that I give you the foundation tonight. We'll be good. We'll have fun. So I, uh, some of you have got holistic nutrition under your belt, and so you probably have some kind of a practice or you're getting ready to set up a practice. And whether it's nutrition or herbology or you're a naturopath or you've got some other kind of holistic practice that you're getting ready to start or you're into, there are challenges that most practitioners face, and these are what they are. The first one is you don't know where to start with your recommendations or how to set therapeutic priorities. When a client first comes in and they tell you what they need help with, oh my goodness, you've got all that information in your head and you just want to share it all with them. And sometimes it's hard to sort it out and decide this comes first, this comes second, this comes third. And, and that is a huge problem because what it usually means we do is we shoot ourselves in the butt we end up seeing that client for the first time, then sending them away with a bit of information, but we then go and spend hours doing research, designing these beautiful programs for our clients so that when they come back, we can present them with everything they need. Problem is you're not getting paid for that time. Unless you're charging several hundred dollars for your consultation, you're not getting paid for that time. And that runs a third risk, and that is that when they come in for that second appointment, you run the risk of overwhelming them with so much information that one of two things happens, and neither of these things serve you or your client well. First thing that happens is they look at everything that you're suggesting they need to do, and they go, well, I give up. I couldn't possibly do all that. That's way too much. How could I even think of doing that much? I can't do it. I'm out of here. So they lose, they're not going to make progress, and you lose because you now have the expensive process of finding another client. We all know that it's less expensive to keep a client than it is to find one, right? The second thing that happens is they come in, you fire hose them with all of this information, everything that's in your head from all of your training, and you've written up this beautiful report, and they go, one, two, I just need those two pieces of information, and I'm out of here. And we end up in the same position that we did with the first situation where that client's got some information, but they're not going to make all the progress they could. And you now need to find another client to fill your schedule with. And so nobody is winning with this. So for those of you, how many of you are in a practice now? Can I just have you click that raise hand icon? How many of you are actually in a practice? And again, we're a small group, so I really need everyone to play in with me tonight. A nutrition practice or herb practice or um, maybe you've got a, a health food store of some kind, something like that. Okay, so some of you do. Thank you for sharing. I really appreciate that. So do these challenges, for those of you who are in practice, do these challenges sound like something that you face? If they do, let's have you raise your hand. Yeah, okay, all right, so I am I am preaching uh, not to the choir, I'm preaching to the people who need to be in the choir. So that's great. So we're going to look at how iridology can help you. But I know these are your problems because I've been there myself. I've been in this industry for nearly 40 years. I know I look like I started when I was 10, just kidding. Um, but I've been in the industry for nearly 40 years and and I did the same thing when I started. No one taught me what I'm going to teach you. This is the school of hard knocks that you're going to hear tonight. I would bring a client in and I'd book them for one hour and spend three hours with them, but only charge them for one hour. I was getting great value. No, 
I was snowballing them. I was not respecting their time, right? I would do iridology photos and then spend an hour writing up this big fancy iridology report and sometimes people didn't come in for the second appointment so I just wasted my time. Good practice for me, but I didn't need more practice, I needed more clients, right? And I've also interviewed a lot of people just like you, holistic nutritionists and herbalists and other practitioners and you know what? If you are struggling with all of those things we mentioned earlier, you're not alone. Most holistic practitioners are struggling with that. And this is why I feel like I can help you because I've been a health coach since 1981. But we do have someone attending the call tonight who has been with me as a client. I won't mention her name. We'll protect her privacy. But she has been with me for a client for, I want to say, probably 23 or 24 years now. Okay, she's been with me a long time. And um, she if, if she remembers differently than that, but I know I saw her through her pregnancy and I know how old that child is, um, let's have her just send me a private message to correct me if 23 or 24 years isn't quite right. Been a master herbalist since 83 and a nutritional consulting practitioner since 94. Uh, I've been a natural nutrition clinical practitioner since 2016. Certified up for iridology the first time around in 93. Actually, I'd done a certification before that, but it was a little flimsy, so I went somewhere else and got more. And then I got more, and then I got more, right? That's what we do, right? Certified Comprehensive Iridology Instructor in 2016. I've been teaching wellness professionals and clients as well since 1985, been running classes and workshops and supporting them. A wife of one, a mom of seven, and a grandma of seven. And I got to tell you, those people in my life have been my lab. They've all survived everything I've done, which sometimes I'm sure was a miracle. But that's where my that's where my real hands-on stuff came from. So iridology can help you, and this is for those of you who are in practice. We'll get to the iridology learning in just a moment here. If you're in practice, it'll help you get rid of your intake form. I think intake forms are atrocious. I think they should be gotten rid of. You need a waiver or a release form, but you do not need an intake form. It will help you start creating deep rapport from the moment you start the consultation instead of starting with you looking down at that awful intake form. I will underscore that a few times. It'll help you do a core assessment in less than five minutes. And at the very end of our, our time together today, I'm going to do a core assessment and it's going to take me less than five minutes. I've timed myself and it is about three and a half to four minutes. And it's very, very thorough. When you've got that core assessment down, you can then start setting priorities based on what you saw in the eye and based on what your client has asked for help with. And you can break what you're doing down into doable steps that will not send your client screaming out of your office. Iridology can help you eliminate your unpaid homework time. Now, if a client comes in with a condition that you know nothing about, then by all means, do some research to learn. But do not spend your, your precious time writing reports for your clients. That is a waste of time in so many ways. Stop overwhelming your clients. That's what iridology can do. I actually make my clients take their own notes. I give them a notepad. And as we talk about their eyes, I give them a notepad. And I'll say, if any of this is stuff you think you need to write down, go ahead and write it down. I'll remember what we talked about, or I can recall it when I look at your photos. So if you want to know it, then you write it down. And some choose to, and some choose not to. Their wellness is not my absolute responsibility. My responsibility is to teach them. Their responsibility is to do the homework. You know, I've had a lot of students with me over the past many years, uh, even before I was a certified iridology instructor, I was teaching iridology, and I've had a lot of students come to me that have been certified as iridologists, but they were never taught how to integrate the iridology with the herbology or with the nutrition, and so they weren't using their iridology. Thinking of uh, one student in particular, she was a naturopath, this is many years ago, she had certified under another well-known iridologist in the U.S. and had even bought an iridology camera. We'll talk about those in a minute, too. And it had all sat in the corner of her office for several years. She had done nothing with it. She studied with me on a few different courses that I was teaching online at the time. And when I started teaching iridology, 
she sent me an email and said, yeah, well, maybe, well, I don't know. I've spent so much money on iridology already and it took me nowhere. And I think it's a waste of time. And I said, listen, I promise that if you take my class, I will change your mind. And she said, well, yeah, you know, I love what you teach. and I've learned so much from you. She's a naturopath and she's learning from me. And I'm going, whoa. And she said, I've learned so much from you and I love your style. Okay, I'll sign up. So she signed up. And after the second class, back then the course was only eight or nine classes long. Now it's 20. But after the second class, she sent me an email. And she said, I get it. I finally get it. Now I know how to use iridology in my practice. I was like, oh, my goodness. And she had not learned that. No one had taught that to her before. I thought that was so sad. So I'm hoping that this just does not sound too good to be true. I'm hoping that you are so so excited to see how you can simplify your practice, how you can integrate everything you know into one neat package that just stay with me for the next hour and 15 minutes and I will demonstrate this to you. Now, whenever you have a new modality, you need the right equipment, right? Every modality has equipment. If you're a massage therapist, you need a massage table and you need oils and you need sheets and you need pillows. If you're a uh, whatever, whatever, you need different kinds of equipment. The same is true with iridology. With iridology, ideally you need a camera. This is $5,000 worth of technology. Is this where you start? Heavens, no. If you are new to iridology, don't you dare go out and spend this kind of money on equipment. Right? Wait until you know you love it. I'm dead serious about that because I think it's a mistake to invest heavily in something if you don't know if you love it. So what can you do? Handheld equipment is where we all start. In fact, I keep mine on my desk. I use it all the time. The exact pieces you're seeing on the screen there. These two pieces have been with me since the very beginning. I don't know when they become antique, but it must be soon. This piece is newer. And so what you need is you need a good pen light that has a really white light because the color of the light will distort the color of the eyes if you've got a color in there. And, you know, lights can be yellowish, they can be bluish. And so you just need to be aware of that. You need a magnifying device that does not have a light in it. This would work, just don't turn on the light, right? A 5X is great. 10X is getting a little bit big, but you could do a 10X if you wanted to. But I would suggest a 5X is a good place to start this is an old fashioned jeweler's loop and it's an 8X and I love it. 8X is great. This piece came from Amazon just recently, just within the past year, it came with three interchangeable lenses. So we've got a 2X, a 5X and a 10X and it has the light. Now you really do need an extra light with this. You cannot do all of your iridology with fixed lighting. So even if you bought all three of these pieces or things like them, it's not gonna cost even $75, right? Check your stamp collecting shops, check um, Amazon, right? Sometimes places like Walmart have things like this as well. So check and buy inexpensive stuff. If it doesn't last you 45 years, it doesn't matter. It was only a few bucks, right? And if you absolutely love it, you can buy higher quality later on. All right, are you ready for some anatomy and physiology? Let's learn about the intestinal tract. You with me? Let's have you raise your hand if you're with me. Yay. Okay. Well, I know I've got a few. good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right. So quick review because we actually did cover this two weeks ago. Those of you who are kind of new to me, I typically run in two week cycles where one week we'll introduce anatomy and physiology, and then we will introduce specific eye signs. Two weeks later, we do case histories based on those eye signs. Okay. And so uh, we don't get into nitty gritty of different lacuna types and different you know, specific things like that. We keep it very broad and very general because the nitty gritty is for, for if you're actually doing a course, right? So when we're looking at the intestinal tract right here, we have the small intestines, which are about an inch in diameter and about 25 feet long. And then we have down here in the lower right hand quadrant of your abdomen, the small intestine connects to the large intestine. The large intestine is roughly three inches in diameter and about five feet long. The small intestine serves the purpose of absorbing most of your nutrients. By the time this liquidy soupy stuff 
hits the large intestine, the large intestine then is going to primarily absorb fluid, minerals, and provide the place for uh, a really high population of biome microbes to complete the digestion of certain nutrients for you and make thereby make certain nutrients for you, as well as protect you from various disease processes. We need to keep this whole system functioning really, really well. Down here, we have what's called the ileocecal valve. It connects the ileum to the cecum, and it controls the flow of stuff from the small intestines to the large intestines. The intestines themselves are aligned with, and this is both small and large, are aligned with villi. So I want you to imagine, for instance, if you had an old-fashioned sheet of linoleum, you know, that or sheet vinyl that you put on your floor. And if you took a piece of that that was about five inches wide and about 25 feet long and rolled it up, that is what the intestinal tract looks like when the villi have been broken off. And that's what happens in some very serious intestinal disorders like Crohn's disease and different celiac disease and things like that. These villi break off. Imagine on the other hand that instead of having linoleum, now you've got a piece of 25 feet long and five inches wide of really plush, luxurious, long thread carpet, right? And it's rolled with that fluffy side in. How much surface area do you actually have? Well, if, if the science tells us that if we take these, this intestine that has that shag carpet-like villi lined surface, cut it open, lay it flat, and literally calculate the surface area of each and every villi, that this absorptive surface is now not five inches by 25 feet. It's the size of a tennis court. That kind of helps us to understand how when people have a condition like celiac disease, how they end up suffering from malnutrition in spite of eating a lot of food. The villi are broken off, they've lost their absorptive surface. I want you to look carefully at each of these villi as well and notice that every villi has three things in it. It has arterial blood, venous blood, and lymphatics. All right, the, the surface of the villi is lined with epithelial cells, and these epithelial cells have to butt up against each other really tight. They're called tight junctions. If something is wrong in the intestines and those junctions start to get loose and gappy, that's when we have leaky gut syndrome. Okay, so we need to keep these junctions really tight. We're gonna come back to an example in an eye of what leaky gut syndrome can look like and uh, a person that actually had some testing done and came out with some interesting numbers. So we need to ask three questions then. I'm gonna have you weigh in on these just to type these. Uh, actually, I'll just have you raise your hand for this. Can we see genetic predispositions in the eyes, and I'll have you type answers in instead, in the eyes that suggest an increased risk of issues with the intestinal tract? And if you would just type in yes or no into your little chat box and just hit send really super fast. Can we see genetic predispositions in the eyes that, that suggest an increased risk of issues with the intestinal tract? Awesome. And we have some of these answers coming in. Oh, I love it. I love it when people play with me in the sandbox. And good answers. We got a couple of yeses and an unsure. And I love the honesty there. Thank you so much. That is brilliant. The answer is yes. What we see in the eye rides is predominantly genetic predisposition. So when we see certain markers, it will suggest that this body has an increased risk of certain issues or of issues in the tissue where the marker is situated. When we see markings that suggest a less resilient intestinal tract, does it mean the person will absolutely have intestinal issues? Again, yes or no. When we see markings that suggest a less resilient intestinal tract, 
doesn't mean the person will absolutely have intestinal issues. Love it. Everyone who answered, answered correctly. The answer is no, because we're only looking at genetic predisposition, right? We need to pair that up with other information before we know what's going on. If there are no intestinal tract markings, does that guarantee the person will not have problems with their intestines? Again, yes or no. If there are no intestinal tract markings, does that guarantee the person will not have problems with intestinal with intestines? Now, this one might be a little harder, but awesome. Fabulous. The answer is no. You might have been born with the absolute strongest gut on the face of the planet, and really, it should last you a lifetime. But you decide that you're going to be a little bit mean and you are going to um, have a junk food diet. You're never going to eat anything healthy. You know, you're into all the chips and the snack foods and the things you'd eat while you're watching a football game and things you drink when you're watching a football game and no nutrition whatsoever. And you can completely and totally destroy your intestines even though you were blessed with strong intestines it's just like a car you can buy a top of the line car never do your lube jobs and oil changes and destroy the car right so you're absolutely right well done that's exciting the intestinal oh we have a little quiz for you a little quiz just to make sure you're paying attention with me tonight that's not what i meant to do i need that one there we go okay so actually couple of quick little polls here. Let's do these real snappy. What kind of equipment do you need when you're starting out doing iridology? A microscope, telescope, a stethoscope, a magnifying device, and pen light, or a Vitamix? All right, so far so good. So far so good. Yay! Everyone got it right. Well done. Thank you so much. And one more little quiz for you here. This is just to make sure, again, we're speaking the same language. What are the finger-like projections in the intestinal tract called? Are they villi, are they strands, are they trabeculae, are they fingers, or are they shag carpet? Love it. We've got smart people with us tonight. We really do. I mean, sometimes people do get some of those answers wrong, so I'm so glad you're paying attention. When we are looking at eyes, there is one particular part in the eye that gives us volumes of information about the intestinal tract, about the nervous system, and a little bit about the personality. And that is the cholerate. This is the cholerate coming around here, this thing that looks like a yarn or a piece of string, thick string, laying on top of the surface of the eye. This is the cholerate. You typically have it showing up in both eyes. And I say typically because sometimes the cholerate is a little bit hard to see. I chose a really clear example for this so you would see where it is. But we're going to see some examples tonight where the cholerate is a little bit harder to see. Again, when we look at this, we need to think back to our anatomy and remember that the uh, small intestines are in the middle of the lower abdomen. The ascending colon goes up the right side of the abdomen. The transverse comes across the top of the abdomen. And the descending colon comes down the left side of the abdomen. Keep that in mind. And I'm hoping you kind of trace that on your own belly as I was saying it. These pictures are set up as if we are looking at someone straight on. So their nose is actually sitting right here. So this would be their right eye. This would be their left eye. So as we look at this, the part that is closest to the nose, and if we were putting this on time zone o'clock, it would be about seven o'clock to about 10.30 or 11 o'clock, roughly. And it would be about you know 1.30 or so to about 4.30 or five on the right eye. This is where the small intestines are, are located in the eye. And then we have in the right side, we have the cecum, which is the beginning part of the large intestine. That's on the lower right quadrant. It's in the right eye. We have the ascending bowel is reflected in the cholerate that comes 
up or it ascends up the right side of the right eye. We have the transverse bowel that is reflected coming across. We have the descending bowel that comes down the left side, it descends down the left iris, and we get into the sigmoid coming down underneath, and the rectum and the anus come off over here. So we have the entire small and large intestine tract reflected in the cholerate. When we are analyzing a cholerate, we're looking for three specific categories, and we don't always see everything on every eye. We always see placement. Well, except for when it's kind of hidden. We'll talk about that in a minute. Is it constricted, balanced, atonic, or irregular? We'll look at examples of some of those. Now, this is an entire two-hour class right there. We look at the shape. Is it star or jagged, doubled, intermittent, or squared? Again, an entire two-hour class will hit some of these tonight. Quality, is it thick and ropey, normal, thin and wispy, or absent and obscure? Again, we may or may not see these clearly in an eye, but those are the categories we are looking for as we begin to look at eyes tonight. Okay, just got to make sure that you've got that some, some of the information we just covered. And so the cholerate is an analog of what? You can choose two answers here, the endocrine system, the intestinal system, the structural system or the nervous system. And you should be able to choose two unless I made a mistake setting this up, which golly, I'm only human. And so just if it's only letting you choose one, would somebody raise their hand and let me know? Is it only letting you choose one? No. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Now we're cooking with gas. Good job. Coming along. Okay. Now there are just a couple seconds in case anyone else needs to weigh in. It looks like there might be one person, maybe one person who needs one more answer and someone who needs two answers. All right. We are going to close that now because we want to finish on time tonight. So yes, yes. Those of you who said the intestinal system and the nervous system, Totally right. Absolutely right. Well done. Let's let's meet this person. Again, this, these are set up as if we're looking right at her face. This is a woman who is 53 years old. She is super active. She's really fit. She's a personal trainer and she teaches spin classes and she races triathlons. She is super fit. She came to me because she's had severe constipation. That has been going on for many years. She's been using a product called Cleanse More, which is herbs and fiber. She finds if she uses it two or three times a week that she will have a bowel movement every day. Um, she's noted also that her hair is falling out. As I as you know, as I'm asking her, what do you need my help with it? She says constipation, and I start looking at her eyes and I start asking questions about things. I asked her if she was on any medications, and she said yes. She was on Synthroid. Ah, well, hypothyroid almost always leads to hair falling out, and hypothyroid almost always leads to constipation. She also said she's prone to anxiety and depression, long history of depression, and she is using a prescription called Luvox, which also has a very strong risk of creating constipation. You seeing a problem here? She also has acid reflux. And so she's been using Zantac. And when you look up the side effects of Zantac, they include depression and constipation. Are we seeing a problem? In addition to what we see in her eyes, her um, and we're, as we look at the cholerate and study that, we're going to find that, yeah, her symptoms are likely made worse by her medications. She also has a strong history of bulimia, and her most recent episode was about five months ago. But she also has a strong history of overeating. So she overeats, then she feels guilty and disgusting, and if she doesn't make herself throw up, that's when she gets the reflux because her stomach is overfull. All right. 
you see how complex she is a little bit of a challenge but we're making progress so looking at her collarette which you can almost not see it's kind of obliterated by light here but even where the light is not in the way the collarette is irregular that means it is not evenly placed when we compare it to the inside edge of the iris so we look here and it goes bump out bump out yeah over here we've got a big bump big bump so it's not fairly evenly placed so it's irregular she is slightly star jagged with all these little points that are on here and when we look for the collarette there are areas that it's really almost not there and in both eyes I I think because I can see some texture changes that it's here but that's just a really educated guess so there's a lot of areas where it's very thin or it's obscured or we can't see it easily. So those are all giving me clues that, yes, while the drugs may be contributing to the problem, the root problem is actually how her system is put together. So when we see this, we want to ask questions. We want to consider what some of the potential issues are. So if the placement is irregular, then it suggests that she may be more prone to inconsistent bowel tone, cramping, constipation, diarrhea. Well, she certainly has some of that, doesn't she? We look at the shape. She's got some starring, so she's got some points. That suggests an increased risk of cramping, constipation, or diarrhea. Hmm. When we have areas that are thin or obscure or difficult to see, it suggests an increased risk of cramping, poor nutrient assimilation, and an increased risk of leaky gut. Now, when we add to that, that we have clouding sitting just outside the collarette, this clouding also suggests that this is a body that is genetically predisposed to leaky gut syndrome. Well, knowing what her problems were, that she's severely constipated, and as we continue to talk, it became really clear that it's more than just constipation, that it's more into an irritable bowel kind of a scenario. So I suggested we should send off some blood work, and we did. We had her test, had her zonulin levels tested. Now, are any of you familiar with zonulin? If you are, would you raise your hand? Okay. All right. So let's do zonulin 101. Thank you for weighing in on that. Zonulin is a protein that is secreted by the gut when there is severe inflammation. And when there is severe inflammation in the gut, there's a high risk of the tight junctions being loose junctions. They're not tight anymore. So when we got her results back, I kind of had to pick my chin up off the floor because a normal healthy reading is zero to six. If, if we get up into the 10 to 20 range, there's likely a good problem brewing or fully active. This woman's reading was 24.4. She was actually off the chart. She was so high. So it's no wonder she's got problems. So our whole focus is getting that inflammation down, getting her pooping regularly, and getting things settled. Right? So that is where we were focusing with her. So we had to ask some questions here. As far as the irregular placement, I needed to know if she wasn't using the, the uh, cleanse more, how often would she have a bowel movement? And it really is like once every five or six days, pretty infrequent. So then we look at the, the starring and I asked, what about cramping or gas? We already knew about constipation. And yeah, she could get into some real cramping, especially the longer she went without having a bowel movement. Then we looked at the quality thin and some of it obscure. Was there sinus mucus? Because the bowel is connected to the sinus. If the bowel can't do the job, it sends the stuff out through the sinuses or through the lungs. Did she know of any food allergies, food sensitivities? How's her immune response? And a little bit mucusy, but not bad. She has food allergies, but she eats the food anyways because she just doesn't want to cut it out. And her immune response is okay, but when she gets under stress, it kind of collapses under her. So we had the work to do now of creating, um, creating a 
a bit of a program for her. So I want to just make sure you've got some of this information again. What symptoms are you likely to find in a person who has an irregular cholerate? Are you likely to find cramping, constipation alternating with diarrhea, and you can choose two answers here, low body temperature or food cravings? Excellent, so far so good, so far so good. Fabulous, excellent, absolutely, that's it. If you see that that's, that irregular cholerate, you're likely to find constipation alternating with diarrhea and cramping. So how many bowel movements did she have a day and what were we going to do about this? Well, um, we needed to get in there and obviously do something serious because we need to get the, her bowel working a whole lot better. If old fecal material is sitting in that large intestine, that is going to irritate the daylights out of the bowel. So we've got to get it moving and keep it moving in a timely fashion. So we talked about increasing fluid, even though she's really physically active, she was often not drinking as much fluid as she really thought she needed, and I agreed. We need to, to increase the fiber in her diet, but these are just recommendations at this point. We haven't given her homework. We needed to, um, we, there's no problem with her using the cleanse more. We wanted to work potentially to reduce her medications, see if we could create a better overall balance for her, but I'm not a licensed doctor. I cannot tell her to stop her meds. So it's really do what we can to get the bowel working and then have her speak with her doctor about how to experiment with the meds when she feels ready. And we wanted to consider using a product called Thyroid Synergy with her to keep that, make that Synthroid work more effectively. For the constipation and diarrhea, we wanted to consider using prebiotics and probiotics as well. Um, and for the cramping and the gas, because if we have the wrong biome happening in that large intestine, we are going to have a lot of gas being produced and that's not going to be good. For the mucus, the allergies, the food sensitivities and the immune response, I was leaning towards some digestive enzymes to help her break things down more efficiently so that she wouldn't have so much waste product to deal with at a cellular level. There's some interesting research going on here at the University of Calgary. And what they are testing at the Kines department is they are testing probiotics, gut biome, and the athlete. Very interesting. What they are finding is that probiotics taken as a supplement do not stick. They go through and they wave hello, but they don't actually help to increase the amount of flora we've got. What they're finding is that in order to build the biome properly, we need to be ingesting prebiotics. So that would be if we're talking about foods, onions, Jerusalem artichoke, bananas are all really good for prebiotics. They've also found that as we look at how the biome is distributed in and outside of our body, the biome is, there is some biome on our skin. Not much, but some. Our, the mouth, the mucous membrane, um, even the throat, the urethra, the vaginal tract have a higher biome content. The stomach is a little bit higher. I know, interesting, right? The stomach is so acidic, but it has a biome. The small intestine has even more, so a higher biome concentration. The highest biome concentration, by far, hands down, by many times over, is actually the large intestine. So if that colon is a little bit deficient in its biome, we are going to have problems, and it's where we need to be getting the biome to build more effectively. We now know the gut is the second brain, we know that we have more serotonin receptors in the intestinal tract than we have in our brain, right? The gut and, and the brain are so interconnected that if the gut is not well, it's no wonder this client has depression, anxiety, bulimia, things like that. And I'm not saying that that is the only cause of those problems, but it will be a contributor to those problems for her. So what did we actually do? Well, recommendations for her out of that whole long list, because we can't do, if we look back, we can't do 
all of everything that's on there. We've got to pick and choose and we've got to choose wisely because we're not in the business of overwhelming our clients, right? So I suggested using the Garden Essence Enzymes from Nature Sunshine. I actually think they are fabulous. Then I, we needed to build the biome. She's really stuck on using a, an encapsulated uh, probiotic. So I said, okay, I won't take that away, but I want you to use kefir as well. Now kefir, oh, I've had such great results with this. Ever since I learned about this research being done at the University of Calgary, I've switched. I don't use probiotics nearly as much now as I use kefir. I'll send my clients to the grocery store to buy organic kefir because you can get it everywhere now. And the difference between taking handfuls of probiotic 11 versus a quarter of a cup of kefir, there is no comparison. The results are so much stronger with the kefir and instantaneous. People feel that instant relief. The gas instantly goes down literally within minutes. So it's a really good option. Now, this client's diet was not great. She was drinking coffee and eating a lot of food on the fly because she's busy. So we had to talk about what coffee is doing to her gut, how that's probably affecting her reflux, and that she really needs the leafy greens in there. I had a client many years ago, um, an, um, a, me a mechanical engineer or something like that. He was a sciencey guy, an engineer of some kind. His wife called and booked his appointment. And I got to tell you, ladies, that's never a good sign right? That means he's coming in usually against his will. He had agreed to come and see me once, but the wife gave me a heads up call. She said, you need to know he's got horrible, bad reflux and he's a science guy. You have one chance with him. If he doesn't like you, doesn't like what you say, doesn't think it's going to work, he'll never come back. Okay. Got it. No pressure. And she said, you will only get to give him one supplement because he doesn't believe anything. Like she's a regular client. I see her twice a year, but he doesn't believe anything that I do. In fact, in spite of the fact that his wife is in incredible shape for being 70 years old and she rides in these grand fondos on her bike and my goodness, she is so fit. He doesn't believe anything we do. So he came in, we're talking, he's got this huge reflux problem, like goes through an economy sized bottle of antacids in a week. How bad is that for you, right? And so I look at his diet. I ask him about his diet. And yeah, he drinks like eight cups of coffee a day. Anyone see a problem with that? If you think that's a problem for reflux, let's have you raise your hand. Yeah, <laughs> some of you are pretty fast on the draw there. It is. It's a huge problem. So knowing I had one chance to do this uh, and to get a response from him, I said, okay. His name was Ernie. I said, Ernie, I understand from what you've told me already, that you don't believe anything I do, because he was really skeptical. And I said, and I understand that I've got one chance, because of that, I've got one chance to do this right. And he said, yeah. And I said, so that means that you have to play all in. If I give you an instruction, you have to do it 100%. And his eyes got big. I don't think he'd ever had his feet held to the fire like that. So I said, here's the one thing that you are going to do. You are going to cut out all of your coffee. I'll give you a bottle of supplements just as a backup, one bottle that you can use as needed, but you will cut out all your coffee. And he looked at me, he goes, it can't be my coffee. I said, want to bet? And he said, okay. I said, so cut it out for a week, just a week, test it, prove me right or prove me wrong. A few days later, I get a phone call and he's saying, dang you, you're right. And I went, yeah, I know. And I said, how's the heartburn? He said, since I quit drinking coffee, 100%, I didn't have another one after I left your office. I've had no more heartburn at all. I went, Great. So I told that story to this client and I said, we got to get your coffee down. Got to reduce your coffee because that's going to have a huge impact on this reflux. And she's busy. She's on the fly all the time. So I had to teach her about chewing her food thoroughly, right? That is so so important. So a couple of months after our first appointment together, she's doing quite a bit better. She hasn't decided to reduce any meds and I'm fine with that. I'm just fine. She's not ready to think about that. That's okay. What I'm excited about is that her bowel movements are much easier, much more regular. 
she's using the cleanse more and I'm fine with that but she's finding that with the enzymes and the kefir the no coffee the leafy greens and chewing that she's got less reflux and better poops moving in the right direction and we are super happy so is this looking good was that fun let's have you raise your hand if that was fun or is it really that I need to get a life? <laughs> awesome, thank you so much. Awesome, thanks for weighing in on that, really appreciate it. So if you think this is fun, how much fun would it be if you could learn all the nitty gritty? So Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology is a course that is coming up that I teach, and it starts May 31st. We'll be cutting off registration on May 29th, so two weeks from tonight. It runs right through the summer and into the end of October. We run it in two sections. You can either do 11 a.m. Mountain Time or 5 p.m. Mountain Time. Now, I don't know what time zones all of you are in. You'll have to do the figuring. We started tonight at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, so this class will start one hour earlier than what we did tonight. Now, space is limited. I am really picky about this in that I want to be able to have a lot of individual one-on-one -on -one time with my students. I want to make sure that they totally understand iridology as they're learning it. So I keep the classes small. And once a class is filled, registration for that class is shut down and nobody else gets in. So I want you to make a note of this URL. Don't go there right now, just write it down because we've got lots more to talk about in lots of different ways. In this course, here's what you're going to learn. You're going to learn how to create your programs right in your sessions and eliminate your unpaid homework time. So for those of you who are practitioners, big deal, right? Big deal. You're going to learn how to do a base assessment in five minutes or less without lengthy intake paperwork. And as I said earlier, I'm going to demonstrate that later on. You'll save time in your appointments. You'll do a better intake. And that's important because you're only going to ask questions that are relevant to your client's needs. These question errors that people use, where they ask every question under the sun, whether it's important to that client or not, what a waste of time. This will help you to prioritize your problems that your client needs help with. They will tell you what they want help with. You will correlate that with what you see in their eyes, and then you will be able to create a program and a sequence of programs that will address your client's needs and move their health forward. You will learn how to connect what you know about nutrition and or herbology to what you discover using dynamic iridology. And you will learn how to do a deeper assessment for more direction and understanding of your client's needs when that is needed. But you know what, that's after six or seven appointments. You can run beautifully six or seven appointments on that first assessment. So you will learn beginning to intermediate iridology and sclerology at a level that will prepare you for the IPA certification exam if you choose. This is International Iridology Practitioners Association. They have a certification program and they charge for the exam. You just need to know that. It's not included in your tuition. Basic nutrition, basic herbology. So you come in with some nutrition or some herbology background and we tie that in to everything we're talking about. Just like we've done tonight where we've talked about leafy greens, we've talked about kefir, we've talked about coffee. We start pulling in what you already know so you actually can see how this is going to work for you. All right. And so let's practice this. Let's see again how this really works for you in class. Case study number two. Um, do I have another poll that I want? Ah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. This is a good one. Okay. Quiz time. All right. So which list is the correct order from the least populated flora to the most? So which list is correct that has the smallest biome to the greatest biome? Good. So far, so good. Yep. Awesome. Wow. Fabulous. Okay, so when we're looking at this, again, the least amount of biome is actually in the mouth, and then the mucous mem and mucous membranes, and then it's the stomach, and then it's the small intestine, and then it's the large intestine. So as we move down the alimentary canal, it gets more and more and more dense. And that is good for us to work with. Awesome. So here we have a female age 37. 
She's five feet, four inches tall, and she's 155 pounds. Now, many of you, when you hear that, you're going to go, wow, she could stand to lose about 20 or 30 pounds. I'm going to tell you she could maybe lose five. And why would I say that? She is a personal trainer, and she trains and races for obstacle course races. This girl has more muscle in her right arm than I have in my entire body. She And she doesn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. She is just really well-toned and really solid. I mean, she can rope climb like a 20-foot or 30-foot rope. Um, she can... Um, she pulls sleds with weights on and I've seen her pull a sled um, at the gym that had a, like a 180 pound man on it. And she can pull that. It's like, holy doodle. I want her with me if I ever end up in a crisis. Right. So that's, that's what she's, that's her basic build. She had a flu October, 2016 up until then her gut was fine. Functioning just fine. But when she had the flu, since then, so this is a year and a half now, she's had chronic gas, bloating, and a painfully distended gut. We're talking six-month pregnant gut. So let's just take a quick look at her eyes because we're going to see that she had the predisposition to gut problems, but it took having the flu to create those problems. That it, what about her, her bowel placement, her colon placement, her colorette placement? <laughs> it's pretty much balanced. We've got a couple of little places where it pokes out a little bit. But for the most part, it's fairly evenly spaced all the way around. So that says that genetically her bowel function should be pretty good. She has a little teeny bit of starring, not a lot, a little bit. So she might have occasional cramping, constipation, diarrhea but we wouldn't expect that to be a theme for her. She has a colorette that is a little bit thickened with some clouding. So this would be the real weak link in her colorette as far as her gut is concerned. That does suggest that thickening and the, the clouding next to it suggests a higher risk of poor digestion, fermentation, byproduct of fermentation is always gas production, bloating and gut distension. So she has this one marker that really could play against her and did when she got the flu. So then we wanted to ask about questions. Well, we didn't really need to ask about the pla any placement questions. So we asked about starring. Did she have cramping, constipation, diarrhea? And yeah, she has a little bit of that, the cramping particularly when she gets really distended with gas. So then we had to ask, based on the colorette and the clouding, does the gas go up or down? So is she burping or is she passing gas? And if she passes gas, does it have an odor? And what makes it worse? I needed to ask her what made it worse. And she said that the things that make, make it worse are grains, legumes, sprouted grain bread, pasta, and oats. Hmm. And then she says, when I asked her about, does the gas go up or down? She says, well, most of it goes up, uh, most of it goes down. Some of it tries to come up. Most of it goes down, but it doesn't pass easily. And when she passes gas, it is a really strong odor, but it is slightly sweet in its, um, in, in its odor, if you will, in its textural, its odor texture, slightly sweet in her opinion. Of course, nobody else thinks it's sweet, but she thinks it has a slightly sweet overtone. And so if you saw someone like that who tended to burp a little, build a lot of gut gas, and when they passed gas, it was slightly sweet, what would you recommend? What would you suggest they try doing? Let's have you type that in your chat box. What would you suggest she try doing? What would you suggest she try doing for these things? I know we've got some good brains here because I recognize some of your names from previous webinars. And even if you've got personal experience, what would you do? If you're prone to a gas buildup, 
what what do you do for it? I'll give you just a minute to do the lightning fingers thing and let me know what your answers are here. I feel like we should play the Jeopardy music here. Right. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> Marissa says, just let it pass through. <laughs> yeah, if only she could. Reduce the processed foods and the carbs. Yeah, and the sugar. Great suggestions. Pro probiotics, kefir, no beans. Excellent, Fumi. Excellent. Those are all fabulous suggestions. Well done. And you know what? I think exactly like you do. Oh, Marissa says increase water. Yeah, being an athlete, she may not be getting enough water and she may need more water between meals to move things through more effectively, right? So I suggested she should chew her food more thoroughly, limit her fluids with meals because that ruins your enzymes, but get more water between meals and eliminate the carbs. So those are all great suggestions. And thank you for weighing in on that. I really appreciate that. So her symptoms actually really sounded like candida. Now, of course, we can't diagnose and we can't prescribe and we don't see candida in the eye. But her symptoms sounded like candida. So we actually took her into a candida diet. She was motivated. And I've known from working with her in the past that when she's motivated, she is 100 percent and she is good to go. And she will really stick with it. So, again, chew foods, limit foods with meals, got her off the carbs. And we suggested that because we really felt like there was yeast. And as we talked about it, she felt there probably was too. We had her take one drop of tea tree oil into four ounces of water and to drink that down twice a day because that will work from the inside. Being an athlete, she needed the calories the carbs were providing. And so we really encouraged her instead to try to pad up her, her calories with her proteins, with her proteins. Now, do you see how using the eyes and using what she brings in as a history, how iridology actually becomes your intake interview? And iridology helps you build the case history. If you can see that, let's have you raise your hand. Yeah. It's pretty slick, isn't it? Pretty easy stuff. Thank you so much. It really does. Iridology becomes your intake interview. The process is this. This is it broken down. Start with asking your clients what they would like help with. Assess their eye rides. Note all the characteristics you can. When you understand them, you can do that assessment with one word point form notes. Ask questions based on what you see in their eye rides and dovetail that with the problems that they brought in that they want your help help with. Create a short list of recommendations, just like we did here. We came up with a list of things that we could choose from. And then choose just a few recommendations from that list. Keep your homework really succinct so that your client can really do it. We want them to be massively successful in baby steps, not a huge failure in one step, right? So just a reminder that registration is open at confidentnutritionist.com. We still have one more analysis to do and a five minute analysis to do. So stay with me. Now, Herbalist, you're looking at this, you're going, the course is called Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology. How is that working with herbs? Well, I'm a herbalist too. And you've already seen that we integrate things like that. I, and in the class, we tie in a lot of herbs. We tie in the nutrition. We tie in lifestyle. We tie in aromatherapy. We pull in a lot of things because there's never just one right answer. So in the course, you actually get 20 classes, live webinars, about 40 hours. So it's two hours once a week. Each class is totally recorded and posted on a student website so you can listen to it later or maybe something happened and you couldn't make it to class, no problem. You can catch it on your own schedule. All of the classes are edited down into topics as well so that you know we cover five or six or eight or ten different topics, like ten different types of lacuna in one class. That's a lot. So there's a recording for each lacuna as well. So if you only need to review one little subtopic, it's there for you. You have access to that student site for 18 months from the start date. 
And after that, you're actually rolled into an alumni site where you have access to all of the information for as long as I'm teaching iridology for. You get a digital textbook in weekly installments. So you download it to your computer or to your tablet, whatever you want, and it's, it's yours to keep digitally. We have cheat sheets. Everybody loves the cheat sheets because what we've done is we've taken this textbook that is well over 150 pages and pulled it down in a synoptic form into charts where we've got the whole course in less than 50 pages with the marking, description of what it looks like, what it means, the questions you would ask, supplements you would suggest, dietary and lifestyle things you would suggest, all in easy to use charts. Quick reference for when you're with a client. Every class starts with a review of the previous week. And this is a great chance for you to also think back, is there something I don't understand from weeks before? And we make sure you're solid. Each week has lots of in-class practice and interaction. So we've had a lot of interaction tonight, but the difference with the class is I unmute all the lines. I know who's on that call on that webinar because they've registered. We unmute and we get to have that constant dialogue back and forth. So if there's something you're not clear on, you can ask it right now and get it answered. You get a certificate of attendance for attending 80% of the classes live. And there's support via a private Facebook group that's just for my students and alumni. And we also do a monthly office hours call where students submit cases they're working on and tough questions. And we discuss those as a group, whoever shows up. So again, it's 40 hours worth of curriculum time that we spend together. So what is the tuition? If you know right now that you want the training and the certification, all of it, you want to get totally ready to take that IPA exam, the tuition is $19.95 Canadian, so that's about $14.95 US. That's the complete curriculum, IPA exam part one and IPA exam part two, because I can give those to you and I'm, I'm supposed to administer those, and so I include those in your course. But what if you're already certified somewhere else and you think, I don't want another certification, or maybe you're thinking, I just don't want to certify, or I don't want to certify right now, maybe. Well, you can do the complete curriculum, just skip the exam prep, which is actually not a part of the 40 hours anyways, for $14.95, which is about $11.25 US. So either way, you're good to go. Now, what if you actually did do the course only and you decide part with it, dang, this is fun. I really want to certify. No problem. I have a standalone certification program that will take you through exam part one and part two prep and uh, get you ready to go. So it doesn't matter whether you, which one you sign up for. Just if you know right now you want to certify, you grab this one. If you're not sure, you grab the other one. So again, it starts May 31st. It will run Thursday nights and uh, 11 a.m. for the morning session, 5 p.m. for the evening session. That's mountain time. So sort that out for based on where you are. And I am just giving everyone a heads up that we are expecting my father to pass away sometime in that time frame. And when he does, I will be taking two weeks off. I will guarantee you I will be a disaster, a total train wreck. And so the end of October timeline is allowing for two weeks off in there. All right. So just so as you know, and there's no big surprises. Um, this course is a super high touch class. You have a lot of access to me on the Facebook page at the Q&A sessions, the office hour sessions, and in class. And I just want you to know that it is super high touch. Some of you may be thinking, actually, I'm just going to flip back one. Gosh, that's a lot to pay for a course. There, are, you know, go online and you'll find that a lot of people are teaching iridology for like five or $600, 40 hour curriculum, but they're doing it as a five day course where you go to them and you do five days, you think, that's great, get it done fast. I'm telling you, it doesn't work well that way. A couple of things, you gotta pay for your airfare, your accommodation when you're there. And then, I don't know about you, but my brain shuts off after like two days. By the time I get to day three, there's nothing more going in. And so, uh, you've got your time off work. It's gonna cost you more than $19.95 to go and do it, and you're gonna come back not feeling rock solid, not ready to do exams part one and part two. It's going to take you a lot of time to get that under your under your belt and feel solid. That's why I insist on doing it two hours at a time once a week because I want you solid. 
my goal is to turn out iridologists who are who will stand shoulder to shoulder with the best iridologists in the world, totally confident, confident from the moment they finish the course, right? And so how it works, you pay your tuition, go to Confident Nutritionist, pay your tuition, and check your email. There should be a form arrive in your email pretty quick after that, and if it doesn't show up for some reason, let me know, and I'll send it to you personally. And that form, you're going to print it up, complete it, fill in all the blanks, Take pictures of all four pages of that form and email them, scan them, and email them back to me. Get them back to me because that's your registration process. And then you're in. As soon as you have paid, you are invited to join the Facebook group and be participating with us right up as much as you can for the next two weeks until we um, until your class starts. I'm going to touch on the IPA exam certification for those of you who might be interested in this. It is a three-part process. Part one, I provide you with access to 10 iris sets, and then you do a complete workup using um, prescribed forms that IPA gives us. When you've done all 10 of those, you send them to me. I mark them. I go through them with a fine-tooth comb. Then you and I meet together online in a webinar to go over your work and make sure you are solid. Now, sometimes students are solid right then, and we can move on to the next part of the exam. Sometimes they're not, and I'll say, you know what, I would be really much happier if you would do two or three more of these for me. These are some spots that we need to work on. Let's make sure they're solid before we go to the next step, right? You got to be solid, and this is just between you and me. Nobody else knows that it's maybe taken you a few extra cases. That's private, you and me. When that's good, then we move on to the next one, which is where IPA has provided us with a case study, which I then provide to you. You do it using the exact same forms that you used for the first 10 cases. You send me your work, and then together you and I, I mark it, then we meet in a private tutorial again to go over your work to make sure you are super solid. And if you're super solid, great. If not, then IPA gives me another case for you. Actually, I have access to it, so they don't know you've done two, just between you and me. And again, this time, we are. I start giving you hints as to how to prepare for the final exam. When you and I both agree you're totally solid, you're hearing that a lot here, right? Totally solid. Then I let IPA know that you are ready for the final exam. You submit the exam request form, the exam fee, they send it to you, you have it supervised, and you do your exam. It is made up of seven parts, and you have to get over 80% on each part. If you miss one part or more, then you need to rewrite those sections only in order to be able to finish your certification process. So far, I've only had one student who's needed to rewrite any sections of her exam. Everybody else has passed completely on the first time. And that's no dispersions on that student, none whatsoever, none whatsoever. It's a tough exam, and it does take four hours. It is a tough exam, but that is how well I'm preparing my students, that very few of them need to do any rewrites, and that is my goal, to eliminate the rewrites. All right, so let's jump into our third case study. Right, okay, so this is um, a female age 26 and she came to me with severe constipation she was having one bowel movement every seven to ten days whether she needed to or not not good now as a side note she had incredible acne just really really bad acne and she was as concerned about the acne as she was about her bowel because she didn't understand how those two things work together. That if the bowel is backlogged, those toxins have to come out through somewhere. We said earlier they can come out through the sinuses and the lungs, but they can also come out through the skin. Okay, So we had to really work on this with her. We needed to also, as we got things moving better, we needed to constantly check her bowel transit time to make sure that things were really getting better. Now, how many of you are familiar with how to check bowel transit time? Let's have you raise your hand. Okay, good. Many of you are. Yeah? 
Okay, so just a quick review for those of you who might not be familiar. Some foods don't digest well. Corn is one of them, right? And liquid chlorophyll is a good staining device. So what we do is we have the person not consume corn for many weeks. So we know that any trace of corn is completely out of their system. And then we give, have them eat three or four mouthfuls of corn, whole kernel corn, without chewing it. I tease them and say, you'll never hear me say this again, but don't chew your food, right? Because that's going to go through whole. They know what time did they eat it, and then they start watching their bowel movements. When they see corn come through the first time, they make a note of it, and then when they see it come through for the last time, they make a note of it, right? And that gives us, from when they ate it to the last time they passed it, gives us their bowel transit time. Ideally, we want that to be about 18 hours about 18 hours. Well, as we started to work, we started to get good progress and her bowel transit time did improve. You can use liquid chlorophyll as well. And all you do is you give them a shot of pure liquid chlorophyll and you have them take it between meals. So an empty stomach. And then what they're going to find is there should be a green stripe in their bowel movement, literally brown, brown, green, brown, brown, right? So that green stripe, that's their marker right there. I've heard people use activated charcoal as well because they get the black marker. I've heard beets as well. That's another good marker. So here we are with this 26-year-old. And um, when we look at her cholerate, what we see is it is mostly constricted. It is mostly sitting far too close to the pupil. That usually will lead to pelleted bowel movements, hard, dry bowel movements. We note that it also is slightly jagged. We've got some bits out here that are a little irregular and a little bit jagged, but her left iris in particular has more jags on it. And so when we see that, we know that she has a minor, is, will be more prone to rather having cramping and diarrhea, but not massive, oh my goodness, cramps, just a little bit of cramping, maybe a little diarrhea, maybe a little constipation because of those jags. Then we also see that the cholerate is predominantly thicker and that there is clouding and other pigment coming off of the cholerate. And so again, that is suggesting a predisposition of poor digestion, fermentation, bloating, and gut distension. Now she has a few other things going on that are not cholerate related. The one that we really wanna to touch on, actually the first two of them, First one is that the cholerate being so tight tells us she's more of an introvert. She would rather be with a small group of close friends than be at a party where she doesn't know anybody, right? She's not a social butterfly. These other rings coming around out here, these lines are called contraction furrows. They tell us that she spends a lot of her time functioning in the central nervous system, or, sorry, in the sympathetic nervous system response zone. So she's always just slightly on edge, always waiting for the next train wreck, the next disaster, the next bomb to go off, always a little bit on edge. Now for some people, being like that actually makes them go into diarrhea but for her, because she's more of the introvert type, it makes her gather her energy in and hold everything in, including whatever is in her bowels. Right? She would love to have the experience of diarrhea, she has told me once or twice. Okay, so we have another little quiz. And it looks like this. Actually, we've got two quizzes. We're going to pop back to another one. Bowel transit time can be assessed with a stopwatch, a train schedule, corn, or chlorophyll. And I think you can choose two here. Doing so far so good, right? Awesome. Yeah. Well done. Awesome. Yeah, perfect. Corn and chlorophyll, those are your answers. And one other quiz while we're here, because I forgot to do this. This is going to test your power of memory. Which of the following is not a part of doing an iris assessment? Telling the clients their eyes contain, and I can't even see the full answers here. Asking the client, uh, asking what the client would like your help with. Asking questions based on what you see 
so which is not a part, looking closely at the client's eye rights, which is not a part. Good, so far so good. I love this, you're so smart. But only half of you have weighed in on it. Couple more seconds to see if anybody else is gonna check and answer here. And I'm really proud of you. Those of you that answered telling the clients their eyes contained contain whatever that first answer actually says all the way because I can't read it on my screen. You got it right. We do ask them what they would like our help with. We do ask questions based on what we see and we look closely at their eye rights. That's what iridology is all about, right? Awesome. So again, when we have this back to our eyes here, a placement that is mostly constricted, we've got all of these symptoms going on. We've talked about these symptoms. Let's move on to the next slide. So what would you recommend if, if you had someone who had thin bowel movements or pelleted bowel movements? Okay, so, okay, so question, what does it mean um, if the autonomic nervous wreath is broken? It means that there is going to be poor nerve feed to the bowel, that there will be interruption in the nerve feed to the entire body, but there may be some predispositions for some mental health issues because it's a cor it correlates to the nervous system, the entire nervous system, and the intestinal tract. Good question, Fumi. Okay, so what would you recommend if someone had, you're welcome, Fumi, if someone had um, pelleted bowel movements or really thin bowel movements? What would you do with that? Do you know what a pelleted bowel movement is? It's where either when they have the bowel movement, it comes out as individual, I call them deer turds or rabbit turds, little balls. Or when they pass their stool, you can see all little balls glued together. So it's not been soft enough to just all mush together into a log. It's little bits all stuck together. Marissa, good suggestions here. Um, yeah, okay, excellent. Let's read what we've got. Dehydration indicated in pelleted bowel movements. Absolutely, Marissa, that is another part of it. Absolutely. And we want to, as suggested, help them manage their stress and increase their water. Good idea, good idea. Someone else I believe said increase fiber and water. Yes, yes, all of those are great suggestions. Really good suggestions. And so here's what we did or possible recommendations, rather, more water, more fiber, and get her being more physically active. Get her walking because that massages the gut, and that helps to stimulate the bowel. And really, the cramping should resolve as the bowel movements become more timely. And the foul gas, she said she has really foul gas the last few days before. No kidding, right? If it's sitting in there for that long, that should also resolve as we get her bowels moving better. So... We did a few of these things. Now, she was really gung-ho, and a few of these things she thought, well, that's not even homework. I can do that. So I actually gave her more homework than I usually give. Increasing her water to a half an ounce for every pound of body weight, she said, super easy, easy peasy. I can do that. Great. She also said that a 30-minute walk per day, no problem. She could totally do that. That she wasn't willing to count as homework. She should just do it anyways. And getting the kefir in because it was a food, no problem. She just packed in her lunch. So that meant that we only needed to really make three suggestions. One was to use a bowel tonic. I used LBS2 just to start pushing things through while we were getting her vegetable intake up to five cups a day. And we also used a little magnesium because that often will help with getting the bowels going. And what happened with her was over the next three months, she became a super pooper and she was so happy because she was going every day. We checked her bowel transit time and it was timely. It was like 18 hours. She could have written the textbook about this girl. But she got really excited because at the same time that her bowel was correcting, she started to have her skin clear up and she ended up with absolutely gorgeous skin. And as we were doing this, she remembered that she had had wicked PMS. She actually called me one day and she said, I don't know whether to hug you or hit you. 
I said, okay, what have I done now? And she said, well, I used to have PMS, so I knew when my period was coming. I never kept track, but I just knew that when my breasts got sore and when I got bitchy, that I was my period was coming and I would be ready for it. She said, I had no PMS. My period started and I was wearing white pants. <laughs> I felt so bad for her. But I said, well, which would you rather have? The PMS and the constipation and the bad skin or not? And she said, I'll take not. I'll start tracking. Thank you. So that was very cool. Very cool. So totally cleared her up. You know, PMS and bad skin always related to, um, often rather related to a really toxic gut. And for her, it truly was. So you've seen the kinds of things that iridology can do with you and how for you and how fun it is to use in a practice. So why would you want to study with me besides the fact that iridology is really cool? Well, I've been where you are. I understand the financial and time constraints of running a business, taking care of family, home, friends, and other important commitments. Remember, I had seven kids. I did all of this while raising those seven kids, right? And now that my kids are grown and gone, my parents are aging and, as I mentioned earlier, not doing well. So time that's been freed up is now time that's being invested with my parents. I understand learning needs. I almost graduated from university as a school teacher, and I decided that wasn't going to be a good fit to teach children. I much prefer teaching adults, but I know we don't all learn in the same way. And I will work with you to help you understand things. If I have to stand on my head, if that's going to make a difference to you, I will do it. I have to learn how to do that again. I haven't done that in a while. I understand there's a lot to learn about iridology and sclerology, and it can be super overwhelming. And that's why I have so many resources on the website so you can work with that between classes and after you've finished your coursework. And we've got the Facebook page and places like that where you get extra support. It's less expensive to study with a Canadian teacher who charges Canadian dollars. There's a lot of Canadians who charge US, right? I'm committed personally to your learning and you won't get passed off to an assistant. That's why my classes are small. Um, some of my students have said some very, very nice things. And so I'm gonna share some of them with you. This certainly isn't everything they've said, but this is Virginia Strivel. She came to me never having done iridology. She'd heard about it. She'd had an Irish reading done once. She's looking in, she's going into being a holistic practitioner and she thought this would be good to know. So she came into my course. Being a novice in iridology, I deeply appreciated your course, Judith. It's complete, deep, and very smartly organized and thought out so that each class builds upon the preceding one until one fine day I was certified. She certified in February. You have all the qualities of a good teacher, knowledge, patience, passion, which I very much enjoyed. However, what I appreciated above all is your incredible gift to identify and ascertain what you see in an iris and the way you are able to see how a variety of markers support each other, we call that triangulation, and then pull in nutrition and other supports. I'll use that vast knowledge both in real life consultations and in her crime novels because she is writing crime novels, which I think is so fun. Uh, Michelle Davies came to me well certified. I was almost a little intimidated. She'd studied with Dr. David Pesek in 2006, did his levels one, two, and three. She studied with Darko Paris and did his professional practice iridology program in 2012. This is what she said. This is the most amazing iridology course I've taken. Wow. Judith's course is top on my list. Judith is very enthusiastic and excited as we are in the course. It has many good examples and stories to share that make the course that much more real in today's world. Judith's iridology course is very informative, descriptive, and complete as it contains the most accurate iridology, including sclerology, and most importantly, how to put it all together and make a proper assessment. I feel most confident in my nutritional practice now. And it's that putting it all together, all together, that none of these other classes gave her. None of them. After she certified, she said this, woohoo, yes, so amazing to become certified. It was a great journey through Judith's class and extended webinar tutoring. Her faith and personal care really made the difference and encouraged me to the finish line, but it doesn't end here. I have gained confidence in myself in promoting good health through nutrition, lifestyle, and personal awareness for optimal health. Amazing, absolutely amazing. So proud of her and the work she's done. And the last one I'm going to share with you today before we get into a few other iridology details. This is Karen Choate. 
from New York. She says, thank you, Judith. It's been such a pleasure studying under you and learning from you. I really miss our classes. Now, I don't know why she always breaks me up here, but I'm looking forward to completing this component of iridology and continuing my education, most hopefully with you. And I do have other programs that I'm beginning to develop to help these people, help my students continue on. I have become much more comfortable with taking photos of my client patient's eyes, and I've begun to implement this incredible work in my practice quite successfully. It really has helped immensely in my decisions and assessments. Thank you for sharing your skill, your knowledge, and your patience. And after she certified, she said this. Thank you, Judith. I'm so very happy. This is a dream realized. And I'm so very thankful that I had the best teacher to educate me. Forever grateful. So some pretty nice things, but because the course really does over deliver. So now it is time to get registered. 1995 or 1495, you get to choose. And remember, I've got your back over here, but some of you are saying, and it always comes up, do you have a payment plan? I don't have 1995 in my back pocket. And you know what? I love payment plans. I do. I really do. Yeah, I've got a payment plan. Four pay of 549. So you make your first payment and then at monthly intervals till we've got four done, it's 549. And if you want the course only without the exam prep, it's 419, four pay of 419. So when you go to confidentnutritionist.com, scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, you'll see the final two big buy now buttons, get me registered. And under that, you'll see text links that say, I'd rather make four payments. And those are the links you will use. There's one set up for the 549 option and one for the 419 option. That's so affordable regardless of whether you've got the money saved up and want to just leap in there or whether it is um, whether you want to do payments it's there for you and as soon as I receive even your first payment you are in like Flint for the Facebook page and things like that totally all in now you might have noticed that all of the eyes we looked at tonight I'm going to run just a few minutes over time tonight probably about 10 minutes for which I apologize but I'm having way too much fun um, most of the eyes we looked at were light colored eyes. They were basically blue or just a light mixed eye. What about dark brown eyes? Now where I live, there's not a lot of dark brown eyes that come see me, but I know some of you live in communities where there are a lot of dark brown eyes and you're wondering, can I see anything? Will this actually work? And the answer is absolutely yes. These are eyes from two different people. When we look at this eye, we see this mark, which tells us about stomach lining. We see some texture in here, which tells about us about stomach integrity. We see the collarette, which we won't always see in a brown eye, but we see it clearly here. We see marks outside of the collarette that are going to tell us things. We've got pigment, more information. We've got these contraction furrows, which we met on one of our previous people today. So we've got that to work with. And we've got a white haze here at just coming over the edge of the iris. Lots to work with. In this other eye, again, we've got a bit of a darker border here. So we've got to work with stomach lining. And this is very specifically information about specific aspects of the stomach lining. We don't see the collarette clearly, but we get a feel for where it probably is. And we've got these lines radiating out that when we combine those with where we think the collarette is, gives us tons of information. We've got these wrinkles, contraction furrows coming around here, more information. We've got this white haze, which tells us that the liver enzymes are probably out of balance and we may be messing up some things in the blood with that. We also then can come to the sclera in this photo and we see all of this vessel around here. And this tells us much about risk of allergies or migraine headaches. We even have information about the circulatory system up here. So even if you're working with dark brown eyes, we can see volumes in those eyes. List of benefits of what you're going to learn here. Again, no more unpaid homework for you. Get it done in your sessions. You'll be able to create those therapeutic sequences that will help your clients to be more successful and will keep them wanting to come back. Because each month you're going to let them know, each time they come in, you're going to let them know when we're finished working on this, the next step will be, and when they understand that there is a plan, they love to come back. You'll be able to get rid of those questionnaires, yeah. Nag, 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 I know. 
I know, I feel strongly about that. You'll be able to develop rapport within minutes because you're looking at the person. You're talking to the person. You're not looking at a stupid form. And you'll be more precise in your client work because you're asking questions that relate to that person directly. All right. Anyone have a stopwatch? I am going to do a five minute analysis on this set of eyes and I guarantee it will be done in less than five minutes. So seriously, if you've got a timer on your phone and want to check it out, do so. I am only going to tell you what I see. I'm not going to tell you what questions I would ask on this because um, when you understand the markings, those questions are just automatic in your brain, right? You just have that response. And so I'm just going to go through the markings that I see. All right, so this is a 58-year-old woman. She's in good health and she's quite active. She has a liver enzyme deficiency called Gilbert syndrome, which means she does not conjugate her bilirubin properly. Now, she um, doesn't go to the doctor very often. She mostly goes to get blood, blood work just to track how well she's doing. And three years ago when she went, everything was hunky bendory. But when she went this past few months, her thyroid was edging up quite dramatically to be almost hypo. And so she's borderline hypothyroid now. When we look at these eyes, they are blue. They've got a blue base. So we know that that means she's prone to elevated acid in her tissues, which puts her at increased risk for certain conditions, which we'll talk about in a minute. So we need to do uh, a very green diet with her, lots of leafy greens and very low acid. She's got a lot of orange in her eyes and the orange tells us she's prone to blood sugar imbalances. And so we need to really teach her about protein and we need to get her to really limit her refined carbohydrates, which she does anyways, but we need to give her that education. She has lots of brown freckles in her eyes, brown spots. And these brown spots tell us the liver has an attitude problem. Now, that could correlate to the Gilbert syndrome quite easily. Um, but it also, there's been some really cool research come out that suggests that these, the darker brown spots have a strong correlation to the MTHFR defect. Some of you may be familiar with that. And MTHFR is a genetic issue where the person doesn't actually um, methylate their B vitamins properly. And so it and it also has a high correlation to things like polycystic ovarian syndrome and so forth. Um, she had no problems getting pregnant and staying pregnant. And so we suspect with her that because she actually already had a fairly high leafy green diet, she was getting enough pre-methylated folate in her leafy greens. She has a bit of comb teeth at the edge of the iris here, which suggests again that her, and putting that along with the central heterochromia, suggests that her stomach may not be as tough and strong as we'd like it to be. She will probably need to chew her food a whole lot better and use digestive enzymes and really not do fluid with her meals. She's got these interesting fibers that are going just all wonky, all loopy, all over the place, right? That suggests a higher risk of arthritis. Now, when she was about 40, she woke up one morning and her hands were seized up. And, you know, take her five or 10 minutes of soaking her hands in hot water to where she could move them. That went on for a few weeks and she went, no, I don't like this. I'm not buying it. And I don't want the t-shirt. So she totally cleaned up her diet, did a massive overhaul, got rid of the arthritic joints, the arthritic tendencies, the symptoms, and has been fine ever since. She also has a bit of errant fiber going on through here, which suggests an increased risk of osteoporosis. So again, we are going to work with those leafy greens tremendously. We're going to support the protein digestion so that she's not ending up over acid from the protein that she needs. We also have netting vessels coming around here, which suggest, as we mentioned earlier, a higher risk of allergies, which is interesting because she told me that even her eye doctor several years ago had asked her if she actually had any allergies. And she has none that she knows of, although she suspects there must be some, but the symptoms are not really overt. All right, how many minutes was that? Raise your hand if that was less than five, I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure it was, okay. Okay, so Fumi's asking why the orange color represents blood sugar imbalance and how does it happen? The orange color can be genetic or inherited. 
And so that's how it happens. And we just know that it does. The correlation has been made that orange has a strong link, a strong correlation to pancreas and blood sugar. Okay. And so with that, you now know, and we did, we did it under five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who timed me on that. I appreciate that. All righty. So with that, again, just the reminder that registration's open and registrations are coming in. And so if you want to make sure you get a spot because space is limited, you want to do this fairly soon and get on this because I'd hate for you to miss out on the opportunity. And with that, my friends, are there any other questions for me this evening before we say goodnight? You've been a great group. Been a great group to work with. I love all the interaction. Some groups are not quite so into it. And thank you for doing that. That makes it so much easier. No other questions for tonight, it looks like. If you have any other questions, particularly about the course, about the content, about registration, feel free to email me. You, uh, my email is on the registration page, but it is, if you want to write it down, judith at cobblestonehealth.com. And uh, feel free to email me, and I'm happy to help you with your registration if you've got any questions. And I look forward to speaking with you soon and seeing you in class, hopefully. Take care and have a good evening. Good night.